the last one is always difficult to keep everybody uh, focused and interest on closing. So the organizers um, have asked me to how the housing partnership connects with the global agendas and how do the global agendas connect uh, with the partnership. So I have here the task of uh, um, taking you to this journey or how these things are connecting do we, with these ambitious agendas that humanity have put in place. Uh, the Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goal 11.1 that talks about the provision of affordable housing for everyone by 2030, but also the new urban agenda in which all the member states of the European Union have undersigned, in addition to many other of these documents, and have committed themselves to achieve this ambitious goal. Let's look, what's, when we speak about uh, the meaning of housing, when we speak about housing, we're talking about the right to adequate housing. What does it mean that there are seven dimensions of adequacy? Uh, Leilani in the beginning spoke about the right to adequate housing, but it didn't define what it means. It means cities. If you can look, it means access to land, security of tenure, which translates the protection of the state against forced eviction. It is access to infrastructure, location, accessibility, and affordability. So it's, it's a complete set when we speak about housing, we're speaking in the United Nations as the right to adequate housing. And we read like this, it's the right uh, to, live, to live somewhere in peace, safety and dignity with access to basic infrastructure in a location that allows adequate access to jobs and opportunities in urban services, all at affordable price. Now, where do the European members, uh, the member states have committed to such a goal. And we have to recall their commitment in the Habitat Agenda in 96 and in 2016, 20 years later, which reads as that, we, the heads of states, of government and official delegations of countries, reaffirm our commitment to the full and progressive realization of the right to adequate housing as provided for an international instrument. So um, I heard here during the day that, well, housing is not really part. Well, if I read this and I read the document that all the member states have signed, well, housing is part and parcel of their commitment and their obligations with the European citizens. Now, if we look at the Charter of the Fundamental Rights of the European Union from 2000 and in, in put in force in the Treaty of Lisbon, you see quite clear, recognize and respects the right to, to social and housing assistance. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but if I would be a lawyer, I would hold accountable, not only the Union, but every member state to, to realize this. But I'm not a lawyer, maybe I'm wrong. So. Is there any convenience? Is there any convergence? Yeah, there is a lot of convergence of what we're doing globally with what you're doing here in the European Union and the partnership. UN Habitat speaks about housing at the center and you speak about the partnership action plan and talks about scale up supply of affordable housing, how the link between housing and sustainable cities, the diversity of housing options in all sense, including tenure, access to housing finance, service land at scale, the supply of that just spoke about, Michaela just spoke about that, the challenge of supplying service land well located that will make housing affordable and accessible to those. The link global and local agendas, the partnership document, the action plan talks about uh, the region, national, local, and the role of cities and promote and realize the right to adequate housing. Now here I'm going to give you the shocking news. And it comes from the sample of cities of 200 cities that we did and we launched in 2006 and we keep analyzing. And it's quite shocking as you will see. These are the sample of 200 cities. And we looked at uh, affordability from the point of view of housing ownership and rental housing. So here you see in every single column is, a is a one city of the 200. And if you look from this perspective, only a very tiny parcel of housing is affordable, which means people living in that city are able to save 
three years of the annual household income, which would cost more or less the price of an affordable housing in those cities. Now, I saw the superstar in the European Union, Milan, uh, Milan 5.7. So, in our criteria, 5.7 is far, far beyond affordability. We take the threshold, the house price to income ratio 3, as a principle to consider a housing sector that provides housing that is affordable. And even if you put to five, you can see there. And there is this city B, we, we didn't give names not to shame, but that particular city is 12.1, which means a household needs to save 12 years of it annual income, not, say, not spending in a movie theater or a plate of food, in order to be able to purchase in standard housing in that city. Now then we say, let's look at the cities per income. Let's split the cities and say low income cities, middle income, high middle income, high income. Surprise, surprise. What do we find in all cities? Housing is unaffordable. So where is this? If you cannot afford housing through ownership, where do you go? Oh, you can rent. Rent is affordable. There is rent control. Barbara is fighting everywhere, so she has rent control everywhere. <laughs> but it's not true. So here we look. And we consider the threshold that 25% of household income committed to housing rent as the threshold for affordability. Well, then you can see, ah, increase a little bit. We have more pe more more cities that actually rental housing is accessible to more households. But then we did the same exercise, splitting the cities by income. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> rental housing is not acceptable. It's not affordable, sorry. So which means in 200 cities, cities that were selected are a sample of 4,000 uh, 600 cities above 100,000 inhabitants in the world. In this sample, housing is not a fault either way. So where do people go? Overcrowding, slums, rooftop, living with parents until they are 45. Even if, when they divorce, they have to live with... Well, where do you go? Street? Yeah, maybe, if it's possible. So we argue very strongly that the lack of affordable housing leads to two things, informal urbanization and growth of slum. This is pervasive for sustainability of cities, for social cohesion, for stability of anything. So physical and spatial, this is the physical and spatial manifestation of the, uh, let's say, poverty in the urban landscape, dynamic informal land and housing markets. And you probably are, have seen this also in Europe and Eastern Europe, and this geography of inequality and segregation. And then you see these divided cities all over, repeating, repeating, repeating. And this is not a, this is not a, a collage, it's a real city. It's a favela in Sao Paulo living next to an apartment building that has a swimming pool in each floor, is an apartment, one million dollar apartment. And this is the divided city you have, but also very close by. This is Paris, 2017. This is Paris, 2017. Now, what is the partnership saying about this? Yeah, it's saying that European household is committing excessive amounts of their disposable income to housing, compromising all the basic needs. This was said here all over and over by many speakers. Housing prices increasing, increasing faster than income and the ability to pay, obviously. Housing costs compelling European households to a poverty trap and inequality that affects social cohesion and the sustainability of cities. We've seen this in many of the places I work in Asia, Africa, Latin America. Housing needs and demand unmet across various income segments. Now, this is interesting because we see in some countries where economic growth have put a lot of people out of poverty and informality keeps increasing. Informal housing, informal land keeps increasing, which means the housing sector has so much distortion and malfunctioning that it's unable to provide affordable housing <laughs> alternatives to this growing population. And I'm speaking about different types of rates of growth than you are used to in the European Union, but it's still, it's the same situation. Divided cities and unsustainable forms of urbanization threats the foundation of European societies. 
and more refugees, migrants, street residents, homeless people living longer with parents in cities. This was said in many presentations here. So this is very common with what we find elsewhere in the world. Now, many European citizens are left behind. This is the reality. And this is exactly what is the Agenda 2030. It's the most ambitious plan that the UN has put in place in the history of humanity with the goal of not leaving anyone behind. But we know people are already behind. Now, how do we get these things done? The beauty, or if I say the interesting part of this agenda, is that there is no more developing countries, the MDGs and the developed countries who provide funding. No. All the countries are developing countries. All the countries, including all those here represented, they all have to set their goals and their targets to transform their society into sustainable society so that we can survive in the years to come. At least the next generation of our kids and grandchildren will have a different world than we have. So this is the agenda. Um, one agenda, five main areas, 17 goals, 169 targets and 240 indicators. And where does the partnership, the EU partnership fit? It fits here in the goal 11, to turn human settlements and communities and cities sustainable, resilient, safe, um, and um, someone, a place where people can live in peace and dignity. The agenda is ambitious, based on five Ps, people, planet, partnership, peace, and prosperity. You can see that the partnership action plan is in full synchronization with this, particularly the, the prosperity, the parts of partnership, and people-centered, and also the peace that these whole dynamics of refugees and conflicts that are emerging in some parts of Europe. And here is our target, and this is where UN Habitat focus. And this is, a, this is just an image to show you. Here's the green, the SDG 11. And if you see education, health, uh, inequality, energy, poverty, all connect with the SDG 11, which is the one that uh, we are responsible and have a custody of a number of indicators and methodologies and technical assistance to member states. And this is a, just an Im image to show you that uh, it, we're looking at the number of SDGs that have the highest connectivity with other SDGs. So health, poverty, inequality, energy, etc. And look at that. Cities is the second largest interaction amongst all the SDGs. This brings a lot of responsibilities to you, to me, to us, people who work in cities because the connectivity, so every action that we will do with our policy in housing, we will have multiplying effect elsewhere. And here it is, the SDG 11 on cities. So the, the EU partnership on action plan, the goals of the EU partnership are consistent with the Agenda 2030 and the SDG 11, so that no one and no place will left behind, provided that it's fully implemented and adopted deals with partnership, capacity building, monitoring and reporting, the rights-based, social inclusion, social and spatial cohesion, sustainability, people-centered. So I'm just doing a wrap-up here because that was my role to remind us that this is what we discussed actually and all the presenters here somehow have touched uh, all these issues. So the connection between global and local is quite clear. And it brings me back to the agenda, well, the, the I don't know how many of you remember the Agenda 21 adopted in, in the UN Conference of Poverty, uh, Environment and Development in 92 in Rio, which was saying, think locally, think globally, act locally, and so on. So this is the axiom that came from the Brundtland Report which define uh, the concept of sustainable development as we know today. So 
everything we do today should not jeopardize the future generations. So the responsibility of the partnership is enormous. We cannot jeopardize the future generations' opportunities in Europe because that's the, your area of concern. So what is the nexus between the SDG 11 and the new urban agenda? How do we synchronize these things? So this is how it says, the SDG 11.1. By 2030, ensure access for all to adequate, safe and affordable housing and basic services and upgrade slums. Don't forget that in many parts of the world, in some places in uh, Europe as well, we see this enormous amount of informality in housing appearing in various ways. So here is a bit of the recommendation that I would do to the members of the partnership. Understand this global commitment that our member states have done. The Agenda 2030 puts a lot of responsibilities on national government. But when we look at the implementation of the SDG 11, particularly the 11.1, .1, it brings down to city responsibilities. A number of cities are taking that responsibilities because many of the targets, the 10 targets of the SDG 11, they are city level. They are garbage, they are air quality, they are mobility, and they are housing, and they are urban renewal and slum upgrade. These are city responsibilities. So we need to work with our mayors, with our city teams to connect these two agendas, the local, global, and e even the, the one that connects the subnational levels. So this is the suggestion. Consider this, the SDG 11.1, .1, as the strategic goal in your, let's say, strategic planning. So this is the strategic objective. Now, the new urban agenda and the agenda that was adopted in the EU, which connects very well with the new urban agenda, but try to find out where are the synchronization that there is in between the two agendas. Is the urban policy, how cities picked up these issues and put them on their territory or their area of jurisdiction. And then housing becomes, because of the amount of resources and the connectivity that the housing sector has with every single aspect of the economy, the backward and forward linkage, the housing sector with a good, robust policy can become an instrument to transformative actions on the ground and therefore realize these strategic objectives. But this requires different thinking and also different articulation, horizontal in terms of partnership and stakeholders collaboration and vertical direction in terms of implementation. So we calling about housing at the center because we believe that could um, be the instrument to implement this global agenda. I'm not going to read this, but just to show you the exercise that I'm particularly doing, looking at the SDG 11, and then I read the new urban agenda, and I found out all these different paragraphs that says supply of adequate housing well located, diversity of housing options, security of tenure, financing housing, progressive realization of the right to adequate housing, policies based on social inclusion, etc., etc., etc. And there is an enormous amount of paragraphs saying how this should be realized on the ground. So housing becomes an instrument for the realization of the SDG as well as the new urban agenda. And I see very clear here with the partnership action planning and the EU urban agenda and the global agenda. So you need to make that clear and transparent because then it will connect you not only to, to the global thinking and action, but also with a lot of funding that are being channeled for the realization of the Agenda 2030. So I made an attempt translating what we're doing in developing countries to your own reality. So the housing at the center of the EU urban agenda, housing at scale and diversity of solutions, finance infrastructure, service land and various forms of subsidy, and then citywide and nationwide urban regeneration and innovation. Why? Because there is an existing stock that some of you said the stock is deteriorating. I remember very well when, when I left the Netherlands and I went to um, habitat in Nairobi, that the, the, the Ministry of Housing from the Netherlands financed a very interesting research finding that in order to bring the housing stock of the high-rise multifamily housing from Eastern European to levels of Western European would be necessary 340 billion euro 
with a period of 40 to 100 years to do the refurbishment and the renovation. If anything was not done, you can imagine the state of the housing stock in these realities. So, and some of you, I can't remember now, showed that there is a, a um, a process of 40 years that is coming close for the enormous renovation of the housing stock in the European Union, which will require more resources. So we need to do the two actions, look at the demand and the, the pressure, but also the change of the household, because households are becoming smaller, so different demand, but also the existing stock that provide opportunity for the realization of these goals. So here we have the scale, diversity, national, local, and capacity, and then several impacts. And I think the documents of the housing uh, partnership shows very well the linkage with health, with education, even some worriness that, you know, if we don't do something, the housing poverty can generate the poverty trap that we find in developing countries. So this is the exercise we're doing. So reading what is the team, is housing, the paragraphs, what are the propositions, and what is the targets of the SDGs. And then this is a good news for you. Cities are taking the lead. Look at New York. New York was the first city in the world to do the voluntary local review. And they put up SDG or the Agenda 2030 at the local level. And I think this is an opportunity for the partnership to work with the cities that are engaged to showcase to the world, hey, cities can do this as well. We don't need the, um, the national government to say, oh, we have to do, no. Cities can do and much more than they're doing actually. Now, this is just to show you the commitment of New York. Um, and the commitment is very interesting because it's the most ambitious affordable housing program in the history. Now, to finalize, housing impact. These are my last slides. Uh, it has been said here about this, so that the impact of housing, the, the, the partnership document has a very interesting part showing about this, the linkage between city and housing. I think we need to explore that more. You know, housing is designed and regulated, so it defines the urban form, it influences spatial patterns, it, uh, the competitiveness in the city, um, and you also have the, the finance mechanism that define the type and quality of housing that people can afford, and the land management that influences inclusionary housing. And you spoke, Michaela, about the challenges of providing land and I agree with you and there are a lot of instruments in other parts of the world that are being used to ensure that house land is available at well located and it's not only for the benefit of the owner but for the city and the collectivity but this is a political fight so finally the final evidence six points for as I would say uh, our recommendations if I can call it like that, based on the evidences so about housing at the center. Sufficient quantity of social housing produced annually to meet the demand and realize the right to adequate housing. Unlock the land supply, service land available at scale. A rental housing sector that provides alternatives for those unable or willing, unwilling to become homeowners. Affordability, sufficient quantity of housing at affordable price and financial service access accessible. Five, Diversified housing options in price, location, standard, tenure, and size within the urban structures of cities. Why am I saying within urban structures of cities? Because we had this incredible production of housing in Mexico, producing 450,000, between 450,000 and 600,000 units per year during a period of 12 years. But the investment of housing moved from 7 kilometers from the city center to 37 the result was abandon of housing dilapidation. And finally, overcrowding will not exist and informality is gradually diminishing and cities getting into a path of planned and sustained urbanization. So this is my contribution and uh, I'm sorry I, I exceeded a little bit uh, the time, but um, I hope that this uh, met uh, with the summary what I heard from the discussions during the day. Thank you.